Welcome to another edition of the Business Brands and the Bottom Line podcast. My guest today is Ron Sharon. He is a Vice President of Information Security for a major financial services company. Welcome to the show, Ron. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So, Ron, we'll talk a little technology, but really what I wanted to talk to you today, and it's kind of a funny subject, is salespeople and how they approach you and all that. Because I, I see you on LinkedIn. That's how I first got connected with you. And uh, you kind of have a lot of fun with salespeople, so we'll get that in a minute. Get that, get to that in a minute. But as a vice president of information security, you've been doing this a long time. Like your CISO, CIO, whatever you want to call it. Um, it especially at a financial services company, I got to believe this is a tough job. Yes, it's very challenging at times. Um, a lot of things are happening all the all the time around us, and we're just uh, uh, catching up with them or. Um, just seeing how they act inside the financial industry. It's amazing. Like we're, we're always dealing with something new. Yeah, no, I can, I can. And these hackers, uh, they're getting good at it. I mean, not getting, they are good at it. There's all sorts of different techniques they use. And, um, but as I talk to people, you know, I'm in sales, I work for, you know, IT consulting companies. You talk to our customers that I see a lot of internal training going on. And I don't mean just the nuts and bolts of training. I think it's the uh, the strategy around it and having the employees be part of the solution versus shaming people. What do you guys What do you guys see around that? Yeah, of course, shaming people to, into uh, security that's never a good solution. Um, um, the people that work with us are our partners in this. It's 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 a corporation. Everybody needs to cooperate to make a company more secure. Um, it's in everybody's interest to do it. Uh, yeah. The way we train people is just, you know, like everybody trains people, um, show them how to do things. If they uh, falter, we don't shame anybody for faltering. We just say, hey, you know what? Something happened. Let's uh, let's review uh, our processes and procedures um, and move forward from that point on uh, to make sure you have the, the correct education to handle if something happens. So ed educating the users, educating uh, the people around us, uh, that's where it's all about. Yeah, no, I'd agree with you. That's what we see the same thing. Because think what's going to happen if you shame someone and make them feel guilty and penalize them and threaten them with being fired, what are they going to do? They're not going to come forward. Exactly. So it, there's not plus, there's no plus side in, in shaming people. Uh, yeah. You don't want anybody to hide anything that's happening in the field. You just want them to come to you and say, hey, something happened. I did this. Great. Let's solve it together. Let's make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah. What are the latest? Uh... What are the latest techniques that you're seeing hackers use out there? I mean, there's the phishing ones, is you know, spoofing. The phishing one is is always number it's always number one because that's the easiest way to get into uh, someone's systems. Um, we've noticed in the last couple of years a shift, so hackers are no longer trying to hit big. Well, they're trying to hit hit big corporations or big companies or companies in general, but now they're going after the end users because it's a much easier point of entry for them. The end user doesn't have an IT team. They don't have a cybersecurity team. They don't have a robust protections like uh, companies, corporations have. Uh, so hackers right now target those people in order to gain entry into some sort of a, a corporate environment because that's kind of easier to do it. Or even um, we saw it a long time ago, starting with the target hack uh, that uh, I believe it was an air conditioning or a refrigerator technician company got hit, his, his laptop got hit. And that, that's how hackers gain interest into uh, the target systems. It's all connected. All the systems are connected, sure. all surrounded. So they're just picking targets which are easier to get into, and then uh, they're moving into the bigger targets from there. Yeah, and, and once they get in, they kind of lay in wait for a while, correct? I mean, they kind of lurk and go east to west. and it, Yes, they're very patient. So right. there's a lot of hacks that are – they. it's not – they gain entry and they do something right away. Sometimes they wait three months, sometimes they wait six months until they're doing something. And it's just because if it's a ransomware attack, for instance, and you go back three months in your uh, backups, you're still infected because they were in your system for six months. So yeah. sometimes companies keep four months of backups, six months of backups is stretching it. So they lie, lie there and wait to the good, uh, when it's a good opportunity, they jump in and, and, and hijack systems. 
Yeah. No, I think, uh, you know, it used to be secure, in my opinion, security used to be, uh, we don't have budget for it this year. We'll we'll wait till next year. And then it's not a problem until it's a problem. Right. And that, and that then everyone scatters and looks for a solution and hire, you know, hires, you know, security companies to come in and do a remediation. Yeah, it's more it's much more in your face today because everywhere you see um, in the new major news, CNN, um, major outlets are reporting on day to day activities of hackers now. So you can see it. So it's, it's a lot more easier than it was 10 years ago where you talk to people about cyber cybersecurity and you're just like, ah, it's never going to happen to us because yeah. we're not big companies enough. But now it's happening to big companies, small companies and to individuals as well. So um, yeah. it's much better than it used to be. Yeah, good. So, uh, you know, as a, as a CISO or CIO or VP of security, however, uh, whatever term, you know, folks like you have, what's your number one role? Like when you get up in the morning, right? You, my job is to do what? And I asked, I kind of know the answer to that, but I kind of want people that are not super familiar with what you do to kind of get a general idea. Well, we, we wake up and our, our whole role is to protect the data, protect the information of people, protect the information of employees your uh, photos if you know if you work for uh, uh, Facebook or Instagram that's what they do over there or my job is in a financial institute of course is to protect the data and uh, the financial data of our clients and of our employees because um, you know your employees also have data stored in systems that are in the company so always protect data of, comp uh, of customers end users employees uh, whoever you're um, working for or with um, that's the sole goal of the security people to just protect yeah. No, and then I see you've been doing this for a long time. And do you actually enjoy it? Yeah, of course. That's, it's I. I think uh, I call us the uh, James Bond of technology world. So we're there out go. there in the in the shadows, fighting for everything to to remain uh, secure and and uh, uh, um, just remain secure. Yeah, and and you can't let up. That's the problem with it. It's not like okay, you caught someone, you're all set. No, it's like tomorrow you wake up and there's someone else trying to get in. Yeah, this, there's not just one person or one group out there. It's, yeah. it's nation states, it's small groups. It's, it's even young people that just downloaded something from uh, online, from the dark web that can try and uh, do some real harm with some, yeah. they're called uh, um, these little kits, that the hacking kits, uh, script kits that can do real, real harm. Um, so it's everyone. Like it's a lot of uh, variables all the time. Cool. Well, on the flip side of that, what don't you like about being a, a, a VP of, techno of security? Uh, there's not a lot of that I don't like. It's just, you know, sometimes it's, it can get very uh, uh, late at night and I have, a, I have a young child and a wife and sometimes my wife does not like it when I <laughs> uh, stick around in my uh, home office too long. She, 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 she shows up in a very angry phase at the, at the door. Yeah. like, babe, you have to go to bed now. It's like 1130. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, so that's kind of sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's because yeah. it never ends. You, you, that, well, that's it. A, you have to give yourself limits. Yeah. No, and that, and you hit it right in the head. I mean, it's not a nine to five job what you do. It's 24-7. I always refer to the Godfather movie when I think it was Hyman Roth says to Michael Corleone, this is the life we chose. Yeah, this is right? the life we chose. This is the life you, you knew getting in. It's going to be weekend. It's going to be nights. Hopefully not every night, but that's just that. That's the way it is with cybersecurity. It's always morning somewhere in the world. That's right. And there's always something that's there's always there's always a lot of bad guys out there that uh, want 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 your money and uh, want your data. Cool. Well, hey, I want to switch directions now. This is actually the real reason I want to have you on. So I'm a sales guy in technology and you know someone like yourself is a, it would be a type of person that i would be calling on and i what what prompted me to kind of reach out to you is i've been following you on linkedin and you really rail against salespeople that just add no value so i it's actually pretty funny to be honest with you but there's a lot of truth to what you say so we'll start out you know i, I guess i'm going to title this section like how not to sell so you know you're out there you and i ask this to everybody you must get hit Hundred times a day by salespeople, correct? That is correct. Yes, hundred times a day. Is that that's not even an exaggeration? Correct. It's not an exaggeration now. So, you know, when you look for a salesperson or a sales organization, what are the things you look for that separate that company from the guy who just lo just lobs stuff at you and wants to sell you stuff? Well, there's a couple of things that needs to align. First is the need. Do I need it right now? Um, 
if I don't need anything and somebody wants to engage with me, hey, just take a look at this product for 30 minutes, uh, but I don't have any plan in the next year or so to purchase some, some product, I'm like, well, it's going to be a waste of 30 minutes. So the one, the number one thing is I would appreciate if somebody asked me, does this align with your next purchasing uh, cycle? Do you want, do you, are you even interested in buying it? Not just drop me some product out of the sky and say, hey, buy it because we're so good. Sometimes I'm not looking. Um, the other thing would be, um, you know, just create some value so I can see what the company does. Because a lot of the times um, people just use marketing keywords. Our, yeah. We do zero trust. One of my biggest pet peeves is somebody that tells me we do zero trust. And I'm like, okay, just you and a million other people do zero trust. I was going to say, yeah. That's every, great. Yeah. What's your, what difference in you from the other million companies that emailed me in the past year about their product? Uh, we are top of the line AI machine learning. And I'm like, great, just you and, and, and about 50 million other companies do top of the line AI and machine learning, which is right now the key marketing keywords. So I would appreciate, give me real value and less, key, and less marketing keywords. It's like, I'm, I'm glad you're using it. And sometimes my biggest pet peeve is when I see people using automations on LinkedIn and I understand, uh. I love automations. But, you know, when you clearly an automation and you're sending it to a million other people at the same time, and it's kind of not, you know, personalized, it's like, I'm just one of a million people and you're just throwing a huge net or helping somebody comes back to you. Yeah, someone raises their hand. I'm not into that. Yeah. No, it's funny. One of my pet peeves on LinkedIn is, say someone re reaches out to me and wants to connect and I hit the accept button. Within a millisecond, I have an, I have an email in, in my in-mail box Telling, telling me how wonderful they are and that they want to sell me something. And I'm not even in a position to buy anything, to be honest with you. But it's uh, that's that's one of my biggest pet peeves is let's, let's you know, so I, I have no problem if someone reaches out to me. You know, I've got a podcast. So I've got people that want to be guests on the show. And it's nice. They reach out. Hey, I'd like to have a discussion sometime. I do this, that, and the other thing. And, uh, you know, would love to have a conversation. So they, they, they don't pounce. They don't yeah. just like try to, you know, my biggest thing is create value um, and people will come to you. Like you don't need to sell. So the biggest secret I think for sell people is to create value that will attract people to come to you. So you don't need to do that major reach out to a million people uh, cold calling. Like my phone in my company that I work at has been on the, uh, do not disturb for the past four years. Because if it wasn't on do not disturb, I would have gotten daily phone calls, about 20 of them, 25, right. 20 of people that found my number online and calling to see if I want this wonderful service. And I'm like, I can't work. I need to do work. My job is not just picking up a phone call and, re and refusing people that want 30 minutes of my time. Yeah. And so you, you touched on a good point. I think most organizations, when they have nothing else to really revert to, they revert to cold calling and they browbeat all their sales reps into, you got to make 50 calls a day when we all know it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It might have, have very low percentage of working, but is it actually worth the effort? I don't think it does. Uh, just as an example of a great way to, to build a community around yourself and just being friendly and just creating good content yeah. is on LinkedIn. They, I, have, uh, I have some friends that uh, they are a salespeople, but they don't sell to you. What they right. do is, okay, once a month, I have a LinkedIn Live where we can talk about cybersecurity or whatever you want. Okay, you do, we don't have to talk about cybersecurity specifically, but let's open the tip. Let's open like the lines. Let's talk to yep. like people. Let's do be more of a community. And I'm like, ah, oh, that's great because right now, if I need something that relates to what she's selling, I'm going to think about her because yeah. she never pushed anything. Right. She never tried to sell many things. She just created good content. She created a good community, a good conversation. Now, yeah, she's separating herself. She's separating right? herself. It's 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 the long game. You don't right. get instant gratification, which is I know what everybody wants right now. But you don't get instant gratification. But it's a very worth long game because you're going to get a lot of cli loyal clients that way. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Playing the long game, I completely agree with that. And unless you're selling like candy bars or something where it's commodity type sales, but what you know, you and I do this is long term relationships, long-term solutions. And like, if you make a decision to go with a certain solution and it doesn't work, that's going to greatly impact you, your company, everyone around you. So you've got to, you know, you've got to make sure that the person that's selling, because I think more importantly, 
a guy like me, we have to be honest with you and say to you, this is not a good fit for you. And these are the reasons why, as opposed to just trying to sell you stuff. And I, I think you tell me, would you respect the salesman more for telling you that we're not a good fit versus we're a fit in the long run? Yeah, of course. I, I never had it actually happen to me personally. Like it's always our solution is great. And then uh, later on, you find out it's not so great. But uh, sure. I would really appreciate if somebody comes to me and say, hey, I looked at it. Like, I'm glad you want to be our client and we're happy to have you. But I don't think we're going to work out just because this is not a great fit at the moment. Once your company is either bigger or here have more uh, a presence on platform X, um, then we'll be a good fit. Um, I yeah. would appreciate that. It's like, just as an example, a long time ago, I had a, I had a conversation with uh, a company that tried to sell some sort of a secure API for Azure. And I said, I'm not for Azure, for AWS. And I said, well, we don't really have a presence on AWS. And they're like, well, if you go ever, well, it does also this, this, and that. And I'm like, well, if I can't use 100% of your platform, why would I pay for it? Why would I pay yeah. only if, if I can use 20% of it? It would be great if they just says, you know what, Ron, I agree with you. If this is not a good fit right now. Call us. Keep us in mind when you, your AWS uh, uh, presence increases. I'll be great. Not a problem. No, I think that's a great, I think, you know, an unhappy customer is worse than having 10 happy customers because, you know, again, again, if you sell something that's not going to work, no one wins on that one. Again, everyone's unhappy. It's, you know, we just, you know, we just, we personally just had a situation where we had a, you know, customer looking at some uh, backup solutions and they had one in mind and we had to go to them and say, Hey, this isn't going to work for you. And, but we gave them data points. Like this is not a good situation because your environment. And so, I think the customer really appreciated it and we moved on to other solutions that we felt like would be a better fit for him yeah and i and i think the customers customers will really appreciate it if you're honest with them and salespeople always need to keep in mind that they're not going to work in the same company for 40 years they might yeah. go to a different company that is there is some solution that i'm looking for or somebody else in my position is looking for but if you maintain that personal relationship and you weren't and you weren't uh, pushy and you weren't like uh, those cringy salespeople, then yeah, you know, they'll think about you, whatever solution you give. they say, hey, I know this, this person, they're great. They're selling X, Y, Z now. I need X, Y, Z. I'm going to talk to them. Right. Yeah. And you hit it right in the head that, you know, it, it's about trust at that point, right? You've got to know that, you know, and that's where all sales, I think, uh, you know, I can't speak for all salespeople, but most salespeople want to get to that point where you have that open, trusting relationship where you, you can be brutally honest with a customer. And, and I think they would appreciate it more than just giving them a line of BS. Yeah, that's true. So one thing I think we touched on a little bit earlier, um, you know, I, I felt like, I you know, I've been selling for a long time and and the sales game has really changed. If you go back 30 years ago, Customers really need, this is before the internet, before even laptops, or you know, there was very little information out there. Customers really needed salespeople to supply information, right? Now, it's so hard for a sales guy to make an impression, kind of like we talked about earlier, because there's so much information on the internet. Like you, you probably, I think the, the statistics that I hear is about 67% of the time, People go to the internet and social media to get their information before they even call a salesperson. Would you agree with that? Is that a yeah. feel yet? I think I think that's totally uh, underestimating it. I think it's even higher than that. Okay. Uh, the first point that you know, uh, people my generation, I'm like uh, I'm a, the X, I'm a Generation X millennial border kind of, uh, but people in my generation and people, of course, millennials, Generation Z. They'll go online to find something. Yeah. You know, uh, earlier, gener uh, uh, later generations, they go to other places now. They go to TikTok or YouTube to find information. So you don't call a um, rep right away. You research. You say you use keywords like, okay, I need the best EDR system. And then you have all these comparison, all these other companies that did work on comparing the best EDR system. Um, of course, each website has their own kind of way and parameters Sure, pair these systems, but that's what you do. And then you go on the website and then you look at the website and then you look at the competitor website. So by the time you, if you reach out to a rep, by the time you reach out to someone, you've already very well educated on their capabilities 
and what they can do. Um, the only thing you need to shoot to, to look at is like something like a demo. How does it look, actually look like behind the scenes? Yeah, um, in your environment. How much money is it going to be? Because most of these companies don't give you a straight answer on, on licensing. You have to call them and you have to negotiate a little bit. Yeah. Um, how, how flexible they are with their, uh, with their licensing because you want to know if you can get some discounts. So that's, so you're skipping the education side almost because you already well know what the capabilities of a platforms are. Yeah. It's funny. You touch on something. I mean, uh, you've been, you've been doing this a long time too. Um, the, uh, the pricing models have drastically changed over the last four to five years. I mean, uh, it seems like subscription and consumption models are, you know, no more perpetual licensing, right? It's all just, you know, yeah. It, so, it, yeah, I tried to look, somebody asked me, can I just buy Microsoft Office? I want to buy like just a suite, you know, I want, I want Word, Excel. And I'm like, you know what? I don't know if you can. Yeah. Uh, it turns out you can. Uh, but, you know, I didn't even know that you can still do that because there, it's somewhere hidden on the Microsoft website in a, in a click somewhere that you can still buy, I think. Um, Word, Excel, PowerPoint uh, is a downloadable, of course, but it's not without any kind of... Uh, a yearly license, but now everything is a yearly license. Uh, you know, I was looking at editing softwares. Uh, most of them right now are, and I, I don't use a Mac. I, I, I don't have the option to use the, the uh, Final Cut Pro, I think it's called the Mac version of it. Um, but I, don't, I can't use it because I don't have one. So I was looking and a lot of them are like $20 a month, $30 a month, $49, $99 a month. Uh, there is a couple that you can actually still download and install and that's, that's it. You, you own them, uh, but a lot of them, I would say 90% is just pay to play for, you know, per month or per year. Um, and once you stop playing, your, your product stops working. So you can't have it like in the good old days, you know. Yeah. I had Word uh, uh, 2001 or Word 2005, and I kept it for eight years because, you know, I didn't want to change it. Yeah. You didn't want to. And, and, and they, uh, you know, they force you to upgrade, right? What, yeah. What so one advantage... Part, it's a part of the yearly subscription fee you upgrade. Yeah. Yeah. That's a one advantage of this, of the subscription model is that you, you get in the latest and greatest all the time. Right. And it's, uh, it's all web-based. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of the new things are web-based. Um, um, again, it's hard, very hard to find again, just things that are on your local computer. They're yeah. just installed. Um, but those are also have the, the yearly or the monthly subscription model. Um, it's yeah. not just web platforms. Yeah. So where do you see where do you see it going in the future? I mean, do you see any changes? I mean, you you, you talk to a lot of companies out there. I mean, what are you what are you hearing and saying out there as far as you know models go? It's probably just going to continue on being the the subscription model because it brings a lot of revenue to the uh, to these companies. Um, they have trained us well to to pay for those and we're paying for those and we don't even think sometimes the, it just gets deducted from our bank account or our visa yeah. visa, and we don't even know it we don't even yeah that's it. the for years yeah and i think that's the real key to this is um it actually is more expensive in the long run right yes, i think it's, it's definitely more expensive in the yeah long there's run. no secret there but again we're, we're kind of in the middle we're, we're integrators so we really don't have a say if the company says hey we're going subscription and consumption model okay then it's up to the, the end was, user. Well, in the good old, uh, if, when Office 365 just started rolling out, um, it was difficult to get companies to agree to migrate to the cloud. They had exchange servers. Uh, we, there were people managing those exchange servers. You know, it, and it, you have to keep them updated and you have to keep them maintained. So it was a lot of work. But then, you know, Office 365 rolled out and it, all of a sudden you can have the same experience, almost the same experience when it first rolled out. Uh, but in the cloud, um, and that, and then you don't have to manage anything. You don't have to patch anything. Exchange patches were almost weekly because they were a big vulnerability on Exchange servers, of course. Um, but kind of companies did not trust it. It's like I don't know if I trust the cloud. It's it's moving all our stuff over there. Uh, so it was in the beginning. It was a struggle. Now it's like oh, everybody just starts out with the cloud. It's like okay, yeah. we're just going to do Office three sixty five or Gmail. Yeah, no, uh, I'd I'd say that. Uh... It's becoming standard, the Office 365. A little bit of Gmail, but I would say Office 365 is, is yeah, kind of like standard at this point. Uh, a lot of startups still like the, the G Suite. Yeah, L less expensive, right? It's, I think it's a dollar 
less expensive from uh, Office 365 from really? the basic side. Okay. Uh, but people are just used to use Gmail. So if you use it at work and you use it in the office and you use it at home, it's the same thing. Um, Office 365 has a lot of more corporate robust, <coughs> sorry, options to it, but you know, people still like the Gmail. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on, uh, on uh, unified communications? I mean, like the teams or the, you know, uh, Cisco or no one has landlines anymore, right? No one has landlines anymore. Um, it's all a part of your unified communication. Um, and you know, most companies have two or three at this point, because again, if they're using office 365, they get teams for free, right? Well, it's included in the package. Um, they can have, you know, chats They can have video calls and, uh, it's a little complicated to do, but you can also route your, your, uh, phones into right. uh, yep. uh, into teams so you can call make calls uh, so it's just a regular phone so you have just one application that you do it for uh but makes for instance, sense everybody uses zoom right despite the fact that uh you have teams people will still pay for zoom which is not a not a cheap solution uh, that also has a phone so you you're you have two two systems of, and i know a lot of companies that at the minimum, they have two different unified communication systems, one Teams and one Zoom. And so, you know, from your standpoint, what would be the benefits and, and what would be the negatives of having both versus one? Um, the, the major benefit in Teams is integrated with Office 365. It's the entire, right. it's the entire integration with Word, Excel, uh, PowerPoint, uh, SharePoint, and your email. It's all connected in the same ecosystem. Uh, so you're just using pretty much one product. Um, Zoom, you have to create another kind of infrastructure, for instance, just, it was just an example, um, to support that. So you need to create all of your um, um, phone numbers again, and you need to create all of the extensions. Um, and it doesn't integrate. With, so you can integrate it with Teams if there is an integration. But again, it's an integration. It's not a, it's not right. a fluid kind of an experience. Um, Teams is a little bit more difficult to manage uh, because it's a Microsoft product and they yeah. don't like to make things easy for some reason. <laughs> um, you know, you're not, you're not the first person that said that, by the way. I've heard that yeah. before. Well, have you ever read a Microsoft white paper? It's like 100 pages long that only like somebody that's been a 30-year engineer, uh, software engineer would understand. They're, they, they, they're very good in what they do, but they overcomplicate a lot of their systems. And they have a lot of systems. Yeah, no, no, no doubt about that. What advice, what, what would be the final advice you would give, you know, folks out there that are getting into sales that, won't, you know, want to build a career for themselves and do it the proper way? Um, my, my first advice would be um, play the long game. Um, leave instant gratification, especially if you're young in the field. Don't go in there thinking, I'm going to hit my, my sales goals in the first three months. I'm going to uh, um, uh, kill it in the first two months. I'm going to have 100 clients in the first six months. Uh, that's a good way to burn out. Um, and that's a good way to alienate a lot of client, uh, potential clients because you're just treating them as numbers and not as people. Yeah. Like, I just need to call 100 people or 1,000 people or a million people to, to make 100 sales. Um, play the long game. Uh, uh, and especially on social media today, uh, and it's, it's, it's something I always tell people I mentor to, your social media outlets are your own. They, your company doesn't own them. So right. if you are currently working for company X, yes, you can do you know, company X content on your, uh, on your LinkedIn, on your uh, Facebook, if, if you use it, not a lot of people use it uh, yeah. right now, on your Twitter or uh, Mastodon or wherever you are. You can, you can use it to connect with people on a personal level, but always remember again, that's your personal space, not right. the company. So if you want to do sales on it, that's great. Do the sale, do, you know, create content, create meaningful content on your own cyber channels, on your own uh, social channels. Um, talk about, um, uh, if you're in the cybersecurity field, talk about cybersecurity, talk about your journey into cybersecurity, talk about solution in the industry. Don't, not, don't, don't try to push your, your solution right away there in, in, in your post or in your conversation. You know, let people get to know you, let people get to know what you're, you bring to the table, um, tell a story, create meaningful content, and people will come to you. Yeah, again, the long game, right? Play the long game. 
Yeah, and I think that's great advice. So, well, uh, Ron, I've really enjoyed this. Like I said, I I thought you were funny on LinkedIn. I think you are very, I like people with strong opinions and you certainly have those. Yeah, so I think the LinkedIn post that you saw was about uh, salespeople probably that uh, uh, I don't have 30 minutes to spare. Yeah, uh, that was the one. Because because 100 people call, uh, talk to me each day and each one of them wants between 15 and 30 minutes to sell their product. And I'm like, I have a day job. My job is not to talk to um, uh, uh, vendors. My day job is to actually do work. Um, I talk to vendors when I need to. And right now I don't need to talk to, to a vendor. Um, and that's why it's important to, to do the long game. Um, it's also be creative, you know, hey, Ron, I just, we're selling a secure API solution. I would like 15 minutes of your time. Just think about how unoriginal that is and think yeah. about that the, the hundred more or more salespeople that sent me the exact same thing. Yeah, I've always, you know, I was taught kind of young. You always need you always need something interesting, something new to get back to a customer with versus, hey, you know, do you have, you know, and I've actually heard this from customers where they say salespeople just call up and say, hey, do you need a quote on anything? You know, not original at all, right? No. And uh, it's hard to stand out if you're not doing that. Yeah. And people think, so, you know, when you do government, I used to do government sales. When you do government sales, there's a port, there's a, at the end of September, I think, that's the end of the uh, federal, uh, it's the end yep. of the federal year end for, yes. for purchasing. So a lot of uh, people that sell to the government call on like September 29th, hey, do you need anything? Do, do you need anything for me to, to sell you? Because they need to spend all their budgets. You know, that's, that doesn't work like that in a, uh, uh, in a private, in the private sector, um, you can give me as many calls. You, you can give me as many discounts. Also, you know this thing about uh, clients talking to me, clients, vendors talking to me about. We'll give you end year discounts, and I'm like, well, if my CFO says we don't sign anything right now, we don't sign anything right now. Even if you're giving us 10, 20 percent discount, it's still a no. Yeah, yeah, but they, but and I'll tell you where that comes. That doesn't come from the salesperson. I can speak from experience. That comes from up above. Yeah, that comes from up above. Yes, you know, some and, some some executive looking at a spreadsheet saying we need that deal, and I've gotten the calls. Hey, you offer them this off, and I hate doing it because you sound like a used car salesman when you do it. But when your boss tells you to do something, you you do it. You do it, and I cringe every time I had to. But you know, it wasn't my company, right? Yeah. So. Well, cool. Well, Ron, I really enjoyed having you on. Any any final words of wisdom for the for the audience out there before we sign off? Uh, always keep going, but uh, always play the long run. The long, I like that. I, I think that's great advice. Just patience, long game. Don't pounce, and I think uh, good things will happen in the long run. Yep, good things will happen in the long run. All right. Well, Ron, again, thanks for being on the show, and and that's a uh, that's a, a wrap for another edition of Business Brains and the Bottom Line Podcast. Until next time. Thank you for having me, Paul. Oh, you're welcome, man. Right?